I first became an area manager of General Electric. I was 25 years old and my challenges were really, really tough. I had uh, men that were twice my age and here I was their boss. Um, but I think that the reason I accomplished a lot was and being first female to actually go to big seminars at that, ta that time was really, really tough because it was really mainly men. But I think that because I respected everyone and showed love and care. And I found something good in each individual person. Because I think that if we give love, love comes back to all of us. And if we treat people as we want to be treated, then it comes back. It's those, the challenging relationships that test you, that make you grow, that you kind of walk away and go, I do not want to deal with that. But if you are in a leader posi leadership position, you have to deal with it. I have to deal with it. I can't stick my head in the sand. I can't pretend like I didn't see it, I didn't hear it, I don't want to do it, I don't want to deal with it. It's my job. A place of learning why that person might be so challenging. What is it about that? Is it me that's putting up a barrier? Is it me that's putting up a wall? Am I subconsciously taking a position of authority or power in and I'm shutting down? Am I listening? Am I hearing you even if I don't like what you're telling me? Am I learning from it? Maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe there's a lot of truth to it. So I think that's what what I've learned, what I've grown from. Sometimes it's painful growth. It's painful growth, but I think I'm better for it. I hope that I'm better for it. And I hope my staff is better for it. That at the end of the day they can trust me they can respect me, and they can know that I got their back. Well, when it comes to relationships, relationship building really is the key to success. You know, they say that leadership, the greatest leaders, it isn't the IQ, it's the EQ. It's your emotional quotient. And that is how you relate to people. And I know the keys to my success have been, uh, well, the keys, the principles are found right in the Bible. And uh, I would like to tell you about a book that, uh, that I recommend for you to get. Um, okay, it, it's written by James Merritt, and it's called How to Impact and Influence Others. It's the nine keys to successful leadership. And this was recommended also by Max Lucado, so it has his stamp of approval on it. And if you will do these things each and every day, you are going to have, uh, just notice by the end of the day how much more positive and good your day is. Now, the things I'm going to tell you, nine things, and putting it, them into my words, they're said very simply. But I do recommend the book because it does go in depth, and it's a very good read. Number one, today, think of this when you go out. Believe that you will get the believe that you will get through every situation with calmness and that calmness will give confidence to other people and influence them. Two, just for today, hang in and don't quit. Three, be thoughtful to someone today. Four, do a good deed, say a good word to someone. Five, be dependable. Keep your word and show up. Six, make others feel more important than you and treat them that way. Seven, respond to what is right. Don't overreact to an inappropriate action of others. Eight, smile. Radiate a delightful attitude. And nine, be loving. Make sure someone sees it, hears it, and feels it. And you probably recognized it, that each one of these are the fruit of the Spirit. And so all of us, inside of us, have that supernatural power to draw on these and to use them each and every day. And if we do that, not only will our lives change, but we are going to have such an impact on the world and in the workplace and influence people. So I, I give you those. To, let's use those nine principles that 
come from the Holy Spirit. I want you to talk about each one of you, because uh, you've and she just lost your daddy, and you just lost your mama, and you just lost a brother. Uh, how do you get through that, and how does your faith play into that? And Lisa, I want to start with you on that. How do I get through it? Not even day to time. Sometimes, sometimes I didn't want to get out of bed. It's been a very challenging, difficult journey over these last eight years. And you might think, well, God, it's been eight years. Get over it already. I'm not over it. I liken it to when, you know, you lose someone and it's like a deep, gaping, gushing wound. The wound eventually heals, but there's still that scar. And I'm still taking care of my mother, whom, of course, I love dearly. And I am so grateful that, you know, she's still with me. But day at a time, sometimes hour at a time, sometimes minute at a time. But coming home and not having anyone, anyone there physically, but how I got through it was knowing that I had my God. I had my God. That those were the times when you're rock bottom and you're in sort of the pit and you have nowhere to go except extend that hand and say, I'm done. I have nowhere else to go, Lord, and if you really love me, how dare we ever test God, right? Did I ever say that? No. But have I ever been closer to Him? No. No. Have I ever been close to Him in the hour, my hour, hours, days, years of need? And what that means, God's hands and, and feet are in the people in my church family and the extended family that literally are his hands and feet that carried me through. Because if I didn't have God, if I didn't know the Lord, if I didn't have a church family, I would be lost. Oh, my mama was 93 years old and she passed away three months ago. She was a mighty woman of God. Uh, loved her dearly. My daddy passed away 20 years ago, so um, now they're they're both gone. But the the experience of my mama dying, um, she was she was quite ill at the end, and so we went through um, just days, days, weeks, days of her being very ill. But. Um, being that she was such a, a, a mighty woman of the Lord, she had seven brothers and sisters who had gone on before her. She uh, was the baby of the family, and all of that family um, loved the Lord. Her mother and father died when she was five years old, and they loved the Lord. So it was, it was definitely, uh, uh, some of you say home going. I say it was a home coming for my mama because she was going home. And I, I can't imagine, I know as I, as I uh, was touching her as she was at the moment she took her final breath, there is no greater privilege than to be there with someone you love when they take that final breath and you know that instant something so supernatural, so fabulous has happened that they walked into the arms of Jesus at that very moment, though you can't see it, your faith knows that that has just happened and you are present for that. That is the most awesome privilege that I have had and I've had it with my daddy and with my mama. And um, there was pure joy. There was pure joy. Though I grieve, there was pure joy in my mama passing because she had gone home. All of her illness, she was whole again, and she was with the family. She was with those brothers and sisters. She was with her mama and daddy. She was with daddy and all the saints that have gone on before her. So we could do nothing but rejoice, and we just had a wonderful service at Palm Avenue Community Church, and um, Pastor Steve did that, and it, it was just a celebration. And afterwards, just I must tell you, my mama gave great teas, and so uh, a formal tea where people sit at the end of each table and pour tea as people come in. So what did my sister and I do? We had a formal tea in honor of my mother uh, during the reception. And um, yes, I'm sad. Yes, I grieve. There are times I think, oh, I'll go see, and then I realize I can't go see mama. But um, there is such joy in my heart because I know that I will see her again one day. Um, I lost a brother about six months ago. He was a brother that everybody would be proud to have. He was 58 years old, 
it was a very, very hard death. Uh, my brother um, served in Vietnam, and he was there for two years while they were spraying that Agent Orange. And at that time, everybody said, it's not going to harm you. You'll be fine. My brother came out of Vietnam, became a, a police officer and a sergeant for the police department for 30 years. He retired two years ago. Six months after he retired, he started having these growths in his neck. Couldn't figure out what they were. Uh, doctors couldn't know what they were. They, they knew it was some kind of lymphoma, some kind of cancer type, but they couldn't do anything for it. They sent him to the City of Hope. At the City of Hope, they operated him four times because the lumps kept growing on the side of his neck. Uh, he finally, they finally realized that he had Agent Orange and he was dying from that. And I'm going to read something that I received uh, after his death that I'm going to read to you guys. And, as, and he says, how we deal with life is really a matter, is really of a personal choice. So I choose to be happy. I find joy in the simple things and I see beauty in each person you meet. When times are difficult, I remind myself that pain comes to you without a it comes to you with a purpose. So I trust God's handcrafted plan that He has made for me. It's kind of hard for me to read this. Let Him love you through life's joyous and painful aspects, and if and if I do that, I will find inner peace and and the ending joy. And that's what he sent to me, and I know that I will see my brother someday again. It has been very tough because of my, the, his children and hit my brother that uh, it is very tough. So I do ask for your prayers because uh, my other brother uh, decided to take extra pills just about three days ago. So it is a very tough situation that I'm in right now, so I need your prayers. I really do appreciate it, and I think that with faith in the Lord and that uh, we're going to be fine. For, um, for myself, um, I, it's a little bit different, but similar in that um, this is February. So about 13 months ago, I lost my father, um, who for, for a lot of these um, stories, there was an illness involved. There was something that um, was expected in a way. And for um, for myself, it was it was quite unexpected. Um, my husband and I had been married for about um, seven months at that point, and so when um, we got a phone call that evening, uh, or I'm sorry, in the morning, you know, the phone rings in the middle of the night, you usually know that something's not good. Um, and so uh, my mom had called in the middle of the evening to say that um, that night my dad had passed away. And so you think, how how does that happen? You know, I mean, I just talked to him 12 hours ago. And so he had a, a massive heart attack, <coughs> excuse me, in the middle of the night. And um, it, was, uh, it was quite unexpected. I do have a, a great support group of people at church and um, of my husband. <laughs> when my, my mom called to tell us um, what had happened, I have a grandfather who's 92 years old. And so we thought, you know, something happened to him. And um, clearly that wasn't the case. And so my husband said, did something happen to, to your grandpa? And I said, no, it was dad. And, and from that moment, we were just um, kind of in this wave of emotion. Um, but for those of you who are um, husbands and fathers, um, I can definitely say that uh, my husband has been a huge uh, source of support for me, a huge uh, foundation and, and a rock in that. Um, and so, and through his um, leading me through this road of grief and this road of, you know, understanding um, his foundation in Christ has made my desire to pursue all the more. Um, I think in situations like these, especially when it's an unknown thing, you think, you know, um, you know, we never, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what will happen, you know, later today. And so when there's this unknown factor, we always think, you know, um, you ask the question of why and how and, and all of those things. And, um, and obviously the Lord can handle those things. They're not, you know, new to him and they're not things that, um, that he doesn't understand. Um, and sometimes I think that in life you think, you know, at some point this will all make sense. 
you know, you'll think, you know, there's a reason for it, there's a purpose for it, and, and, there, and there is, and I know that, um, but, you know, and I always think, too, that I don't think I'll know what that purpose is until, um, until we get to heaven and we get to see that, so, um, but to how to handle that, um, my husband and I, in our house, we have um, lots of artwork that have the word hope in it, um, because we know that in all things that um, that's all there is, is you continue to hope. Um, and the Lord continues to provide that support and that encouragement. Um, and um, and for, um, for all of us, we think, you know, we just last night, my husband and I were reading through Ecclesiastes, and so... As we were reading through that, we were thinking, uh, there's a time for everything. If you were to Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, time to plant, time to uproot, you know, all these different aspects of things. And so um, we're reminded that there is a time for those things. And so um, there's definitely redeeming hope in knowing that just like there's a time where, you know, all of us will pass away at some point, um, unknown to when that would be, um, there's also the hope of, of new life. And so... Um, we feel very blessed that that's a part of our life as well. So.